Boom. We're here. Dude, we're back. I feel back like again. Shady's back. Tell a friend. Guess who's, guess back. who's back? Yeah, guess, guess who's, who's back. back? Guess who's Oh my god. All right, let's never we're do back, that again. Baby. Now we're gonna get sued because we um, said more than like four lines. I we speaking of we're back, I think you and I need to watch this movie at some point. What movie? We're back, a dinosaur story. Done. Dude, it's probably one of the greatest movies ever written. You know, it was really disappointing last time we were talking about Three Ninjas, the movie Three Ninjas. <laughs> Dude, it so is good. not anywhere for free. You have to pay for it to rent it. Like it's on any streaming service. That's so absurd. Yeah, three ninety nine to rent Three Ninjas. That's that. That seems like asinine. Yeah, it seems like one of those things Netflix should have on. Like, I just don't. What are you paying for Netflix for? Yeah, I feel like they should always be on there. Mm hmm. So, Brad, yo, what's new? Um, let's see. I don't know. Not a lot. It's a uh, cool we're story. In, Thanks what, for I building mean, up the conversation I, there. I was talking to my parents about this. It's like, so it's been March, April, May, June, July. We're on like month five of like every day feels the exact same. Mm hmm. So it's like, I, I don't know what day it is. I don't know what month it is. I don't know what week it is. All I know is I wake up and I work and I go to bed. And sometimes I go outside. Sometimes <laughs> I go outside. Like that's, that's, that's the motto of 2020. Yeah. It yeah. has been probably the most, one of the most productive years of my life so far. That's for darn sure. I think this has been the least productive year of my life. Really? Yeah. How is that possible? <clears throat> I'm just, I don't know. I just, I just don't think it is. I, I and I work from home. It's not like this is new. I just can't take it anymore. Oh my god! <laughs> I don't know. Somebody, somebody comment. Why is Brad not wearing a polo? Because it's Monday and I do what I want, and it's way too hot in my house to wear my suit jacket right now. You're the most unprofessional human being I've ever seen. That's so true. <laughs> Nancy said, "Good morning, good morning, Nancy." So, Brad, today I think we're going to talk about starvation mode starvation mode is that like what happens when i wake up every morning and i'm just hungry af um i don't know i don't wake up hungry i'm normal oh that's but, but that's because i eat a bunch before i go to bed <laughs> well that makes sense yeah um no it is not oh, okay well what is it um it is well what is it or what is the myth of it that's the uh the fun part right it's the the myth is if you don't eat enough you will gain weight or if you don't eat enough you will not gain weight um which there's some truth to to some of that but the the overarching pop culture is you have to if you don't eat enough calories you'll get fat that's the over overarching message that we that we hear in the uh in the facebook group coming from clients sometimes uh when they're first starting coaching and you just see in every message board so how would that work? Like, if that were true, and I'm not saying it is, because I'm we're gonna dive into this, but how like what is the mechanism by which people say this works? And we're talking we're talking about the theory, the myth, right? Yes. Like yeah. So so the the I think before we get into the the theory, you gotta talk about what really happens. And, and just a brief, we'll obviously get more into it, but you know, when you eat less food, you have less energy, you move less. You, you, you fidget less, you're less active, you're less likely to. Uh, an example I always use is if I'm really hungry and waiting to eat my food, like I'm, I'm sitting down somewhere in my house, I'm in my kitchen, I'm in my living room and I'm like, oh my God, I am starving. Am I going to make three, tr and then am I going to make, and I'm, but I'm watching a movie, so I got to get back to it. Am I going to make three trips from the kitchen to go get something to drink, come back, uh, something to eat, to come back? and condiments and come back or am i going to carry it all in my arms in one big giant trip because i'm starving one big giant one trip. big giant trip so i've used less energy to go get that food so you have less <laughs> energy you have you have less food in you you have less energy so you're not burning as many calories so that's where it comes from because you eat less <clears throat> that's i mean there's obviously a lot more to it which we'll get into but you eat less food you do have less energy to, to use your body's going to slow down okay. but people take it to the extreme where it's, I am, you're not eating enough. You are going to just, your body's going to shut down and say, you're not getting enough food. We have to preserve body fat. And then you are never, ever, if you, there's, you hit a limit and your body just won't lose fat at all. 
There's right. nothing you can do about it, which is not true because people can starve to death. So what evidence would you say there is to the contrary? Uh, the biggest one would be the Minnesota starvation experiments where they didn't feed people and they uh, were, they gave them very, very low calorie intakes. You would know the exact specifics of it better than I would. You know, what's funny is the, uh, the calories that they consumed on a semi-starvation diet was yeah. around 1700 calories a day. It's still, yeah, that's tons. They made it's them good. do work though too, didn't they? Yeah, it was because it's the relative deficit, right? right? So their total energy expenditure, I mean, it was just also a different time. Like mm -hmm. people were way more active and their basal and their like total daily energy expenditures were quite a bit higher. Um, but they're like maintenance calories. And these were like people who were smaller than me. Um, mm -hmm. and I am I'm not a big person. Um was like somewhere around 3,200 to 3,500 calories a day. So they were really on somewhere in the neighborhood of almost a 2,000 calorie a day deficit for months. Yeah. And these were, these were conscientious, conscientious objectors to world war two. And those who were, who might've had like, like flat feet or something where they just, they weren't, they, they would have been able to, but they were able to do manual labor, but they weren't able to be combat troops. Yeah. I, and I don't, I'm a little fuzzy <laughs> on the specifics of like what made them conscientious objectors. And um, I believe the most of them were, I, I, I believe most of them are Mormons. Yeah. Yeah, and I I don't remember all those details because I don't think I ever really read the subject recruitment stuff that intensely. I was more interested on the metabolic side of things. Yeah, and I, I was really interested on the uh, <laughs> the conscientious objector political aspect of the study. So I read a ton on it. There was what's really interesting is the the psychological pieces too. Yeah, yeah. Some of them had lifelong issues after that. They became became really fixated on food and all sorts yep. of stuff. Yeah, the, the and it's kind of interesting when you read it and you if you talk to a bodybuilder, uh, a physique athlete post show, that's they exhibit every symptom that those guys that the the people in that study did. Yeah. So the, yeah, so the myth is if you don't eat enough, you're gonna your body's going to naturally know you're not eating enough and 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 shut down. But it's not that you know, and and that does you do slow down naturally, which is true. But the uh, the the problem in the in the urban legend the myth the way this has been taken out in pop culture is that you can't get past that there's nothing you can do to to get weight loss and some of the some of the variations of that myth um include that you'll gain fat you'll you'll get fat if you drop down below and 1200 calories is this magic number that somehow people just get in their head that pops up in every single nutrition rumor you can imagine um and it's once you get to that 1200 calorie mark it uh you're, you're gonna store all your body fat and you'll you'll probably gain weight, which we know <clears throat> is a uh, using that absolute. If that absolute number is irrelevant, and on a relative basis, you will slow down. But we can counteract that by sometimes increasing food a little bit or increasing activity. So let's maybe walk through some of the like the thought processes around this, right? Like, what are what are some of the things that maybe give this idea a little bit of credence and like, where does it break down? Ooh. Um, I think that the, the, the biggest thing that gives it, <clears throat> that gives it any sort of credence and any credibility where people are going to follow it is the fact that <clears throat> when you, when you diet people, when you diet and you're not getting progress or when you think you're dieting and you're not getting progress, people are going to look for any excuse any reason why it's not working. Right. I think that's, mm -hmm. that's the first thing. It, it's never anything I'm doing. It's, it's got, there has to be a simple explanation for why I'm not losing because I'm tracking. Um, and then you go, Oh, well, I'm just not eating enough. So even if they have, and, and a lot of time, and there's a lot of uh, components to that if I have, <clears throat> let's say I'm eating 1500 calories a day and that's a 500 calorie a day deficit and I'm not losing weight and I should be, um, a lot of a lot of times you'll see people who are they're tracking 100 percent accurately for the items they actually track they're overeating on other things at night they're going over their calories um they're snacking off their kids plates because they're hungry and then when you give them 1800 calories a day they magically lose weight and that's because now you are they're they're they have more calories to stay full so they've cut out that that untracked snacking so they're tracking more accurately because they're tra tracking every single thing they're eating and now they're making progress so instead of 
supposed they're supposed to be at fifteen hundred, but with on track food they're over two thousand. Now you have them at eighteen hundred, and they're tracking, and they're actually at eighteen hundred because they're actually tracking everything that's going in their mouth and being full. Mm -hmm. I think I think that is the biggest reason that people believe it. So that's probably some of the like why in reality these things happen. Um, I mean, Sorry, did and, and I miss the point of your question? No, I, no, and I'm, oh. and that's what we see. Like if you look at and some of the interesting things is. Um, if you look at very low calorie diet studies where they take people and they give them like 1200 calories a day, 900 calories a day, or 600 calories a day, the weight loss between all of those groups is essentially identical. Now you would think, well, the 600 calorie group should lose more weight. The problem is, is adherence in those groups is absolutely abysmal. Like it is atrocious. So the adherence in the total caloric intake is actually almost identical between 600 calories of people who what they're prescribed and 1200 calories because the the adherence breaks down you put um, you put your quotes over people instead of your air quotes were over people instead of calories <laughs> so just so everybody knows we're sometimes talking about people lasers <laughs> um oh. so so that's i mean and that's one of the things that we do see in the the literature from like an actual heart outcome now one of the interesting things um, at least to me, is if you actually look and you kind of dive into um, the the actual like metabolic literature, there are some things that happen both at decreasing calorie intakes and increasing calorie intakes that I think are at least interesting to note, um, and that people can you know really find like some actual evidence of starvation mode, so to speak, or what we actually will call metabolic adaptation, because that's a little bit more of an accurate term. Um, but the interesting thing is we can also quantify exactly how much your body actually adapts in even the most extreme circumstances, such as the Minnesota starvation study, right? Where if you think, okay, I'm going to put somebody on a 2000 calorie a day deficit, that's probably going to be like the most extreme version of starvation outside of like you know, pretty, pretty horrible war crimes. Um, how's the body going to respond? And we've done those studies and we can actually like look at what is the level of metabolic adaptation that actually occurs to like your, your overall metabolism. Are you, are you asking me or was that, you're saying we can look at what happens, right? I'm making sure there wasn't a question. Yeah, I, there. I was, I was okay. trying to like I ended on an uptick in that. I was, I, like, was oh. I was trying to hope you'd be like, well, what are those adaptations? Well, oh, Jay, let me Brad, tell you, Brad. What are those adaptations that we're able to measure from things like the Minnesota starvation experiment? Well, Jay, let me tell you. Um, so it's very interesting, and it it doesn't just happen in that study, but we've done, uh, probably several dozen studies on this topic. Um, and here's really what we know. As you decrease calorie intake, your total energy expenditure, which is made up of your basal metabolic rate, your non-exercise activity, your exercise activity, and your thermic effect of food. As you decrease calorie intake and you lose weight, all of those components will drop, right? But the biggest components that decrease are non-exercise activity, and thermic effect of food. So actually, the reduction in thermic effect of food is greater than your basal metabolic rate drop, right? So if you go from consuming 3,000 calories a day to 2,000 calories a day, you're going to have 10% less overall thermic effect of food, which is in the neighborhood of, what, 100 plus calories, right? Because you're dropping 1,000 out of your diet. Now, yeah. if you look at the level of metabolic adaptation that occurs when people are dieting and most of it's from meat. So that's anywhere in the neighborhood of 200 calories to a thousand calories a day that people will just decrease their energy expenditure. Um, the average is somewhere between 300 and 400 basal metabolic rate from my kind of read of the literature, your BMR will decrease as you lose weight. And as you go into pretty aggressive calorie deficits, somewhere in the neighborhood of, 50 calories per about 1,000 calorie reduction. That's kind of a rough ballpark um, of what you can kind of expect. Now, that's almost negligible. Yeah. Right? So that means your, your, your decrease in your thermic effect of food of dropping 1,000 calories out is almost twice what your change in basal metabolic rate is. 
-hmm. So this starvation mode really is not anything that has to do with your overall, like your basal metabolic rate changing substantially. It has to do with how much less you move, your lower thermic effect of food, and then probably your desire to exercise goes down and -hmm. your adherence drops. So those are the real like meaningful things that happen in starvation mode. Quick side note. Um, yeah. Is a quick question, I guess. Is the thermic effect of food, is that included? And that's the energy that it takes to digest your food, uh, right? <laughs> yeah, digest, okay. absorb, so, all that stuff. Uh, yeah. Is that number, is the energy included in there? Is that amount of energy that's used included in each gram of macronutrients? So in a fo- in four calories per carbohydrate, is that is the TEF in the TEF included? Um, because I've gone back, I've heard I've heard both answers from very credible people, and I've never I've never asked you this, but I've heard both ways from many people. Um, I, at the ISSN conference, I think it was twenty sixteen or seventeen. Um, there were presentations by reputable people and. The presentations were at different times, different rooms, and both presenters said the opposite. Yeah. So, I mean, I would say <clears throat> I don't have the definitive answer. Yeah. Um, my thoughts would be it probably is not. That's that's my thought, too. Because, because if you, yeah, because if you think about it, like we know, um, like we know the thermic effect of each macronutrient is different, mm-hmm. right? And we know that on average, protein is the thermic effect of a macronutrient somewhere between 20 and 35%, mm-hmm. right? Um, and carbohydrates and fats are more like 5 to 15%. Um, the, the structure of protein and carbohydrates and the energy in the bonds don't seem to me to be so much different that they would have the exact same calories per gram. Um, right. after you accounted for thermic effect of macronutrient, but I don't have a solid answer. My gut that, would tell me it's not included in it, but it definitely could be. Yeah, I, I don't think it would be because a calorie is the amount of energy needed to raise temperature of water. So that would just be a calorie. Thermic effect of food is something that's in a closed loop, in a closed system in the human body. Well, open if you count heat disbursements, but it's in the human body. So it would be not included in that overall calculation that would make sense to me yeah. because it's two di- it's two different things like i just don't <laughs> i just don't see why it would be um and then i i also wanted to like uh, on that add in the note then if you're thinking about the thermic effect of food and like oh my god i could get 10 percent more food because it's not accounted for uh that's not true yeah. because when you're all the formulas that are used to calculate your 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 macros and your calories they take that into consideration the calories don't in your grams per calories per gram of protein, fats, carbs, but the calorie, the calculations to figure out how many you should eat do take that into effect for the average person. Yeah. So, and, and, and on all, everything you said, building that in, especially the, the food, the food cravings, the decreased need, the de- the decreased, um, 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 not endurance, the decrease, um, drive to exercise. Yeah. I, I think that these are all <clears throat> things that can be seen very, very well. And I believe, and they're pretty, and they're studied pretty often in physique athletes. <laughs> they're people yeah. who do this very often, um, repeatedly to themselves. And a lot of them are, you know, these are people who are pretty in tune, maybe not accurately, but they're definitely in tune with how they're with, with nutrition and things like that and can report pretty pretty accurately, especially with the new wave of researchers who are bodybuilders. Um, and I, th- I think those are a lot of good studies. If anybody's looking for anything else on there, there's a lot of good studies by a lot of, uh, uh, there's a lot of good studies based around physique athletes and starvation and, um, decrease in need and, um, stalls in progress. Yeah. <clears throat> so what else you got? Um, I have uh, so well. Unless you have some, go ahead. I no, a follow up for it. this point. Right, what is in in your opinion? What is the if if I'm dieting for seven months and yes. and all of a sudden and I I lower my calories and they're low enough and I think I hit starvation mode. I've plateaued. I drop my calories. 
I, progress stalled at 1500. I dropped down to 1200. Progress still doesn't stall. And I actually kind of, I, I, maybe the scale went up by like a half a percent over two weeks. Okay. What do you think is the number one thing that somebody can do to counteract that? Do I drop further? Do I increase my calories back to where they were? Or do I take an overall diet break? Or do I make sure that I just grind it out and get my minimum steps in per day? Um, I would and it can say, obviously be a blend, but pick number one. Yeah, I would say it really depends on the person. Um, but I don't have a great, like, everybody should do this in that situation. Mm-hmm. Um, I think it really depends on, like how close are you to your goal? Like if you're still, if you've hit a plateau for that long and you're still 20 pounds away from your goal, I'd probably take a break and come Mm -hmm. back to it. Um, But if you're like three or four pounds away, um, the thing that I always tell people is the first thing to look at is like an actual honest, objective representation of your non-exercise activity. Mm -hmm. Cause that's the biggest thing that moves the needle. Um, And then look at your, make sure your adherence is high on your calorie intake. And if those two things are still on point, even if you're super close to your goal, I would take a break. Mm -hmm. So that would be, that would be my uh, thought process. Yeah. Taking, taking, I I agree. You got to look at it individually. I would say that the most common thing you see is assuming that we have proper tracking, assuming that you are not within two to three pounds of your, of your goal weight. um, I would say that, yeah, it's probably time to take a break. For, yeah. for most people, for a lot of people. All right. <clears throat> Let's see. We got some comments here, Brad. Let's do it. Carol said, awesome for doing this first thing in the morning. It's only first thing for morning because you're <laughs> in the most amazing place in the world, the U.S. That's true. Or you're in like the 27th most amazing place in, in the world, Canada. I don't know. It's probably number two, but we'll we'll call it 27. Deal. Uh, Michelle said, hey. Hey, Michelle. Dante okay. said, Good vibes, but it's morning time for Dante too, and he's in South America. So that's true. Uh, hey, is this is this witty? And she changed her Facebook name. Her YouTube name is backwards. Uh, I don't is know. That, is that what happened? But or is there sure. an imposter? Brad, it's you need imposter. a slideshow. You need a slideshow for this. Um, hold on one second. We have an article. I we have more than one article i have an You're... article that i wrote but never actually apparently published so let me share my screen with you <laughs> oh my god well good good for all the podcast people brad's gonna share his screen to uh, a, uh, uh somebody asked while you do- oh we'll get back so i us. have i have a 50 oh. slide lecture on all of these things including very pretty charts and graphs look at all these things see i've seen have- this before i know you have where at a conference Oh, okay. I knew I see. I paid attention to you. Look at that. And Are you proud of me? I also have. Let me pull up. Um, Aren't you proud that I paid attention to something you created and I remembered it from like two years ago? I'm uh, proud of me for that. To to quote Drake, I'm so I'm so I'm so proud of you. And Brad's gonna take a break for a minute, so we'll be back. <laughs> and then here's an article that I wrote the entire thing. It's 13 pages long, and I just need to publish it. Is it gonna be like peer reviewed, published, or published on NutriWiki? Uh, no, this will be on NutriWiki. Okay. I'm kind of maybe over like major peer review publications at this point in my life. I mean, oh. I'll probably publish a few every couple of years, but like I I'm publishing five to seven a year anymore. It's just like, I'm not so, in academia. So can you publish a paper and get it peer reviewed and published? It has to be published. peer. I don't care what journal it's in. It just has to be peer reviewed and published on why I am so awesome. Um, can it be a predatory journal where I just pay to play? Oh, I thought you meant an article on how I'm a predator. <laughs> you turned that wrong. Yeah, absolutely. I'll pay for it to be published. It just has there, to be published. There are journals where literally if oh, you yeah. if you pay them, they will publish it. Yeah, I get I get emails. I'm not a public I'm not a researcher and I get articles on it all, all the time for our co- increase your increase your company's uh marketing exposure. Yeah. Yeah. Seems legit. But <laughs> I, I would like to be in the uh American Journal of Kick Ass Living. So if you could get that oh under my God, that's awesome. <laughs> I don't think anything says screams America more than that. America. 
That's I'm gonna watch that movie tonight. Dude, Andrew. that movie is that movie is probably one of the greatest pieces of comedy ever made. Uh, the the guys from South Park are just on it nonstop. Have it's you ever so seen there was a documentary made on how they make a South Park episode? Dude, um, it's a ton of work. Yeah, but it's hysterical what they do. So those guys don't actually write a script until like a week before it has to be done. And they just make everybody work like 20 hour days because they they want to stay relevant and on current topics. Yeah. So they wait like if the episode has to be aired on Tuesday, they don't start writing until the Monday before. I mean, like <laughs> if I had to do that like once a month and that was my work, I'd love it. Yeah. I mean, they do it for what? 26 weeks, out, 26 times out of the year and 12 maybe. Yeah, so like they take a week off and then they just have like a cram week. Yeah, and I think when you're that like when you're that big, you literally just tell people, here's what we're writing. Yeah. <laughs> we're covering this hot hot topic to it. That's what yeah. we need, Brad. Oh, I can cover hot topics. Let's hot topic. Remember that store? Oh yeah. Is it still around? Yeah. That's scary. I know. Uh, why are the last five questions from our Facebook group? Why are the last five pounds so freaking hard to lose? Question mark, question mark. Let me show you a graph of weight loss from the Minnesota starvation study. So this is even in like the most ridiculous method of losing weight possible. And this okay. will hopefully explain it. Come on, Google Chrome. Um, can you see this? Yes, I can. So see this graph of how it's very asymptotic. So this, these were on people who are like, how basically. Very, can you say that in the, how it's very what? Asymptotic. That just sounds like a dirty word. Yeah. It's an asymptote. It, it approaches, uh, can you say like it for a, those like of us who change? Can you say it for those of us who drop? See how, see how college? the curve flattens right here. Yeah. So between days zero and 80, these people mm -hmm. lost almost 30 pounds. Okay. Between day 80 and 120, <clears throat> they only lost about eight pounds. And then between okay. days 120 and 160, they lost about four and a half to five pounds. So it's the opposite of a hockey stick. It's the opposite of a hockey stick, right? So the closer you get to a low, the lower your body weight gets. And the closer mm -hmm. that your new body weight is to your maintenance calorie, mm -hmm. the slower weight loss is going to be. So the last five pounds are always going to be the hardest to lose, just from a mathematical standpoint. Is is and obviously I can't see it in this graph. I can't even read the numbers because my eyesight's bad. But the resolution's fine. I just can't see. Is the <clears throat> is the percentage that they're losing week to week? Does that drastically Drop. decrease as well or is it the yep. absolute number that they're losing it's the it's the percentage okay it's both okay and th and that makes sense why it would decrease if i'm 200 pounds and i lose one percent and i'm losing at first one percent a week and then when i get to 100 pounds even losing one percent a week i'm only gonna lose a pound a week at that point yeah. yes sir okay so that makes sense so it's just harder because you adapt more and you have less spare body fat to lose yeah and let's just say there's zero metabolic adaptation like let's say your neat stays the same your basal metabolic rate stays the same all your hormones stay the same your as you lose weight your level of maintenance just to maintain your body mass is mm -hmm. lower okay so let's say your original maintenance was 2500 and you're eating at 1500 right mm-hmm and as you, let's say you started at 160 and you want to get to 115. Well, by the time you get to 120, your new maintenance is probably 1700. So now your actual relative deficit is 800 calories less than it was when you were 160. Okay. So it's it's even just like just the, the math works out that way too. Right. The unreasonable effectiveness of mathematics, Mr. J. Oh, thank you. Can I remove this? Thank you. Um, guess who's back? I'm fired up today. If anybody wants to co-host with Brad, I will. Uh, I'm willing to take a vacation. How rude! Uh, Joan says, "New to counting macros, where do I start?" You can go to macrosinc.net/ebook, and you will be able to download our guide to flexible dieting, and that will uh, <clears throat> that will give you probably the best jump start, and then utilize the the group the macrosync.net slash free group or the Facebook group if you're in there. 
um, ask any questions, get live contact with our uh, live help, live public free help with our moderators and coaches. Um, and then, of course, if you're confused, want a guided approach or just want to jumpstart this, uh, macrosync.net slash services. And you can get a two-week free trial. We give a two-week free trial for our nutrition coaching. You get a consult with the coach. You can get all set up. And uh, re really, it's designed to, to, to let you see if – to talk to a coach and see if your goals – uh, align are something that need coaching. We we have clients come in who get their consult, and the coaches turn around and say, "Hey, this this is something I think you have on your own. I don't think you really need coaching. You can still stick with it, but I think you're capable of it." And people leave, and that's uh, we don't want <clears throat> we don't want to take people's money if they don't need coaching, <laughs> um, because if you don't need it, you're not going to use it, and it's just not worth it for anybody. You're muted. Let's just say. I don't want you if I don't need you. Yeah, exactly. Is that what you're trying to say? Yes. Amber, Amber Shaw said, Bonjour. No. I feel like I know that's good morning in Italian, but doesn't that also sound like maybe a type of cheese? Um, sounds like it looks like bologna cheese. If I had to pick a word, bologna that's what I would, cheese? yeah, that's what I would guess. If I was reading that and didn't know what it meant, I would just guess that's like Italian for bologna. You're crazy. Yeah. Yo, I want. I miss bologna. I want bologna sandwich today. Oh, bologna is fantastic. No. I used to work with a guy at a firehouse who, whenever it was his time to cook, he was an older guy and he was the shift commander. And every once in a while, I'd be like, "I'm cooking today," and his, he, I mean, he, and he was 100 percent serious, not even a joke. He, he, he thought he was a gourmet chef, and he would make fried bologna sandwiches for everybody. Dude, that's probably really good, but probably also terrible for you. Yeah, but it was amazing. Fried ham, fried ham, cheese ham, bologna. Heather said, if you calculate your macros, is it bad to use the painful setting to lose weight faster? No. Um, no, not Sustainable? necessarily. Sustainable, right? Mm, it depends. Yeah. yeah. Sometimes what, what <clears throat> I've done with clients, um, especially clients who have a lot to lose, is people are motivated in the very beginning, right? And if you don't keep them motivated or build off that motivation, you'll, lo you'll lose people. So a lot of times I would always start off clients, um, especially those who had a lot of weight to lose, with, with pretty good sized deficits for, for two weeks. You get really good results. You can, get, you can get somebody, if you have somebody who's 300 pounds, you can have them reasonably lose 15 pounds in two weeks with a good sized deficit. A lot of it's water, um, but they won't, they're not going to feel hungry because they're motivated. And then after they lose those 10 to 15 pounds in, in, in fat and water weight, um, decrease, increase, give them a little more food, let that weight loss slow. And it keeps their motivation up, keeps them hungry and increases compliance. You are the smartest man alive. I'm just really good at manipulation. That's how you, I, I, I got you to work here. Um, <laughs> Whitty said, yes, this is her. She logged in by work on accident and then she switched. She did the old switcheroo. And now she's here. The old switcheroo. With the right name. Brad, you're so smart. Someone needs a nap in our Facebook group. Dude, I need a nap. Me too. Can I have a nap? What he says, math is the best. Math is sort of cool. Actually, you know what's really crazy? What? That we understand the mathematics of like the universe at the Planck scale on the most complicated thing imaginable yet some of us can't even figure out how to like balance a do, checkbook do normal fractions anymore <laughs> <laughs> i think it's interesting that we had people alive in that people in the early 20th century still understood all of math one person could understand all of mathematics i don't know if anybody actually did but the like idea that somebody could Yes. Could, could comprehend it, yeah. And that's yeah. that doesn't exist anymore from um, my understanding. What I think is crazy, like if you look back in the like two, three thousand BC, mm -hmm. the amount of math those people like understood is was mind blowing. Mm -hmm. It's a bonkers. Yeah, there was a, a, a infographic, it was a YouTube video that explained the like history of evolution of mathematics. And it's kind of crazy, like there was this huge like from nothing from you know wandering primates to this huge understanding of of mathematics and 
astronomy and things like yeah. that that allowed the pyramids to be built and all these temples all around the world. And then it kind of decreased yeah. and then stayed level through like Rome and yeah. then the Dark Ages. And then... Well, the over, Dark Ages, then, everything just went to... Right, trash. right. And then we had to relearn stuff and then it, it kind of shot up and now we're at here. But it'd be interesting if we would have... Th they modeled it where if we would have stayed in the path from you know, where we had this great understanding and not hit the dark ages, it would we, be, uh, I think it was like, in, it was like two orders of magnitude higher is where the prediction model was. It, it cited a source. If you ever want to read it, I can find the video. Yeah. But <clears throat> yeah, it, it was a crazy, it was Eric Weinstein. It cited, uh, cited a bunch of stuff from Eric Weinstein and it was kind of interesting. Um, you ever bologna and yellow mustard. There you go. Ambra is on to something it, with, it, or, you can use ketchup too, or both like a bologna sandwich. It's like a hot dog brand. It's uh, literally bologna is just a hot dog. Not doing it. You don't eat hot dogs. I don't eat bologna. It's a hot dog. I don't eat bologna. I just don't do it. I think it's bologna. <laughs> that was a good one. <laughs> and I'll give you credit for it. Uh... How does gut health affect your weight loss, Brad? Um, <clears throat> It definitely can. Um, <clears throat> this is a very complex topic that's way out of my league. So if you have poor gut health, you're not really full of shit. Or you're or you're very full of shit. Well, I meant because you're emptying it out. Um yeah, I mean it definitely can. <laughs> we have we've seen studies in both um a lot in mice, um some data in humans. The the problem is I don't I don't believe the so some of the thought processes around this are basically if you take some there's these mice experiments where if you take an obese mouse and you take its microbiome and you transplant it into a lean mouse it will the lean mouse will become obese and kind of vice versa where if you take an obese mouse and you transplant the microbiome of a uh, a lean mouse it will become lean now. There's some, there's like some methodological issues with the papers that were published on this. Um, so there's some concerns around the data validity. But the bigger thing is the reason mice in a lab become obese and the reason humans become obese are substantially different. Um, so trying to, trying to transport the mechanism of action for microbiome related obesity and or weight loss, um, trying to ascribe what we see in a lab mouse under controlled conditions and then humans in the modern world. They just, they just don't match. Um, so that's kind of the first thing. Now, there are some reasons to think that a highly disturbed microbiome can make it more difficult to lose weight. Now, that doesn't mean impossible. Um, you may have a microbiome that makes you more efficient at extracting fatty acids out of fiber so you get more calories. Um, you may have some changes to central nervous system due to microbiome that changes behavior, et cetera. But there doesn't, I haven't seen anything compelling to suggest that if you have some weird gut health problem that it's impossible to lose weight. Um, but this is also way out of my league. So there's probably a lot that I don't know. Two, two questions. One with genetically modified mice, would it be possible for me to have an army and by army, I mean, you know, 10, um, <clears throat> super jacked mice, like, like, oh, 100%. okay, yeah. um, yeah, three mouse questions. knockout mice. Okay, so question two Will you buy and train me 10 super jacked mice? And can I give and follow up, can I give them steroid injections to make them even more jacked? Um, let me look this up. So, we're okay. gonna, you're gonna buy you, this is what I want for my birthday, Brad. I want 10 mice. jacked mice. And if we get them hairless, even better. Um, so I think we can actually order them from Jackson Labs. <clears throat> Jackson or Jacked Labs? Jackson Labs. So Exxon of the myostatin 3 genus <clears throat> flanked by LOX P sites. Da, 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 da. Okay. So the. Ooh. Oh, that's um, cryo recovery. So I can freeze mice and unfreeze them, and they'll be fine. Uh, they're, uh, the, gen the genes. So basically you can then make as many of these mice as you want. Uh, 
I just want little <laughs> jacked mice. And I want them to be intelligent mice, Brad, so that way when I whistle, they all stand up. This is the the Myo D. I'm I'm actually just looking to see how much it would cost me to buy ten for you. <laughs> so <clears throat> while you're looking up my mice army, um, my mouse army, my mouse army, um, you'd said <clears throat> that it's easier to control mice. Mice in the experiment are different than humans. What if we're the experiment, Brad? I mean, that's also that's very Stephen I mean, King of are, you, but aren't the odds? Aren't the the statistician in you, and I'll speak to you as the statistician, aren't the odds better that we are a simulation than we are living in the timeline that creates the simulation? Yes. Yeah. And actually, I think the odds are better that we're a simulation in a simulation. Um, so I'm guessing it's probably, it says cryo recovery is about 2850. Um I'd have to call and see how many mice you could get out of the cryo recovery because they're Jackson is doing things way different than when I used to order mice. Um, so twenty eight fifty for a mouse. Uh, this is for the cryo recovery or twenty six hundred for the frozen mouse embryo. But I don't Which want you, an embryo. But you can then clone it. I, I don't want to clone a mouse. <laughs> I just want a bunch of jacked mice. That's what I'm saying. Is you'd have to do this, then you would breed them. So you can have Jackson do it, and then they will charge you per like how long it takes to do it and how many cages and all that sort of stuff. I'm guessing it's probably going to cost you somewhere in the neighborhood of five to 10 grand for 10 of them. All right. Well, you're the CFO. Can we budget in jacked mice that I'm just going to like, we'll, we'll mess with it. Like come up with an experiment that we can do that. I need 10 jacked mice. And then we will name them all Brad Morgan, one Brad Morgan, two Brad oh Morgan, God. three. I've actually, then- I've actually uh, handled and seen uh, myostatin knockout mice. Are they just giant? Dude, it's, it is nuts. Let me see if I can show sure, Pull up a picture of one. I, I want, I just want this big, you know, those, those cows that have the, that have the knockout gene, right? Oh yeah. Yeah. That's what I want the mice to look like or a yes. horse. Could we do this to a horse? Could I just get some big jacked horse? Um, yes. Okay. We got a little bit off topic here. I'm sorry. No, but this is awesome. But this is this is what our show is. So okay. for anybody who's listening on the podcast, I highly recommend that you go to uh, macrosinc.net slash YouTube and watch this episode from uh, August 3rd is when we're recording it. Look at that mouse. He is huge. So this, is, this is a regular C. I think yeah. that this looks like a regular C57 Black 6. Of course. And this is this is the mouse that knockout mice. So this is a mouse that has the, the mouse that knockout mice don't they, they're always in muscle protein synthesis or they don't muscle protein breakdown. So they, they don't they basically don't have the breaks. So myostatin inhibits muscle growth. So when you knock out myostatin, you basically just have gene transcription and um, muscle protein synthesis basically always going. Now up. you said go to that go back. Hold on. I'm gonna see if I can pull up. The- now you said that this. We've talked about this before. You said this is possible to do in people, right? Yes. Why don't we do it? What's the downside to this? Um, what is another disease that is Cancer. primarily classified by uncontrolled growth? Cancer. Yeah. So is is that is that do they see a lot of cancer in these mice, or do, do mice typically die before they get to that? Um, I would have to double check. Now the problem with um, <clears throat> and, and the reason I said I'd have to double check is because. So if you look at laboratory look at mice, chest, look at the chest on that mouse, dude. I'm telling you, like, look that at the chest, difference. That mouse yeah. is gigantic. It's quad. But, its legs are just. But also notice how like the the actual musculature itself looks different. Yeah, it changes so the, everything. Yeah, so the quality may. I haven't spent a ton of time um, doing this, but. So I don't know all of the details on like muscle architecture and stuff like that. But um, so to answer your question, there's kind of two features here. One is obviously this myostatin <laughs> gene knockout will cause uncontrolled growth in, in musculature. The other thing is laboratory mice um, have been bred such that they have a increased risk of cancer over wild type mice because of what's happened to their telomeres. Um, okay. I think Brett Weinstein's talk, yeah. talked about this. Like that was kind of what his doctoral work focused in, on. In bats, right? Um, Cause his doctoral I think, work I think was in bats. Yeah. Was, but he like stumbled upon this idea and okay. Yeah. So very interesting stuff though. But yes, this is what a myostatin knockout mouse looks like. Yeah, Cause he's Brett Weinstein for anybody who does not know. I highly recommend you go look up Brett Weinstein and anything bat related. Cause he specifically studied, uh, 
coronavirus a, in bats. <laughs> these are myostatin knockout cows. <clears throat> yeah. Or myostatin blocker cows. I mean, look at that. Is just, what kind of cow? I mean, we these are we eat these cows though, don't we? I don't. I have no idea. Because I know. I mean, there, there's a big industry for them. I just don't know what it's for. Do they have, they have myostatin knockout dogs too, don't they? Like um, so. So this is actually it's a natural uh, gene mutation that will call, it occurs in bull whippets. Right, but I mean they breed for that gene mutation, correct? Um, yes and no. the The problem is, is bull whippets are very like greyhound like dogs. Mm -hmm. So when they become, um, when they have this genetic mutation, they're not like nearly as fast because they're just too muscular. But yeah, this is the difference between a. Like this is a regular bull whip it. And this yeah. is a uh yeah. bull whip it that has this genetic mutation. I mean, they look awesome. I mean, that dog would terrify me. There are myostatin horses too. Yeah. That's it's, pretty there's always yeah, gene mutations. <clears throat> yeah, no, it's just pretty crazy. Oh, here, there's a whole I'm look, there's a uh whole Somehow I got on a presentation on uh, myostatin and its applications in animal breeding. <clears throat> and it's just a picture of a jacked sheep and a giant ass turkey. We should send a jacked sheep to Brad Morgan. <laughs> yes. How, how far off topic are we today? Uh, we went from a lot of viewers to not many anymore. <laughs> so, all right. Now, getting back to nutrition... <laughs> We started out strong. We're almost on the hour mark. Um, what else were we going to talk about today? We were going to talk about one other thing that we did not get to. Um, that was going to be quality versus quantity. Maybe we'll do that one on Wednesday. Word, dirty bird. So um, let's see. Let's get to the rest of our questions, and we'll just wrap up since we just spent 20 minutes talking about giant jacked mice for me as pets. Um, let's see. And all this started from how does gut health affect your weight loss? <laughs> Uh, Gwen Ferguson said increasing daily caloric intake is a struggle. I'm not sure, uh, to do this. I'm struggling to increase my daily caloric intake. I'm around 1200 most days. If you're not hungry. Um, so if you're trying to lose weight or if you're trying to put on muscle mass, we'll have two different answers. Yeah. So if you're trying to lose and you're not hungry, don't force yourself to eat more. Yeah. If you're trying to gain, um, you need to eat more, um, Calorie dense foods, more sugary thing, more more things that are, you know, more hyper palatable foods. Maybe maybe you're trying to increase and you you normally eat big voluminous meals and you're not hungry. So maybe we cut one of those out and we go to McDonald's and get a large fry. That's a that's a way to get calories. <clears throat> maybe not the best way, but it is an absolute way to get calories in. Um, and if you're having, the, you know, if 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 four of your five meals through the day are compl are super well balanced and minimally processed foods, having a McDonald's fry is not going to cause any any harm when you're trying to slowly and steadily and in a very healthy manner gain weight. Word, dirty bird. Uh, Cindy said, "Very full of shit." <laughs> that was to our comment for gut health. My comment. Bang, um, Michelle said we should do a fundraiser for the mice oh yeah how funny would that be i want oh you know instead of mice could i get uh knockout ferrets um i i don't know if they have those knockout ferrets but i would imagine it's not that difficult could you make me knockout ferrets um i could if you gave me the requisite resources okay so we'll do a fundraiser to build up the lab to do two things one to make knockout ferrets and two to make a knockout j and then, i mean no. and then three to clone things because we could do that too yeah I so you, you would be better off seeing if you could get like a clinical faculty appointment at a university and use their facilities and then just pay for the time that you're doing the work. Because if you wanted to build your own vivarium, it would cost you squillions of dollars. Like probably 10 to 20 million at least. Really? Oh, animal vivariums are hugely expensive. So you're telling me that I can never probably have my own animal vivarium. 
Um, disappointing news, Brad. Probably not a research grade one. No, no. if you want to do just like backyard barn stuff, yeah. yeah, yeah. Could we do that for like a couple hundred thousand? Yeah, I bet for a million we could build one. And where we could, where we could do what? Clone, like a horse, if I wanted to. Um, I mean, you're gonna need a big barn, but well, yeah. But you like, could do you could do all the like lab work in a building that size. So we we could build for like a million bucks. Could we build a facility that I'm like I want to clone this cat? We could clone this cat. You could build the facility. I don't think you could fill it with the equipment you would need for a million. What's the point of the facility then? Um, you have to have all of the like proper building envelopes and um, like. What's the word I'm looking for? Um, not sanitation, but like sterilization. Sterilization, that kind of stuff, and that's that's not cheap. Okay, well, build me, build me this, so I can start cloning things. Yeah, I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna send you random DNA samples in the mail from random things and say clone this, and then you have to figure out what it is. Dude, I could, I could do that. I, if I ever make a boatload of money i do think i'm gonna turn my basement like half of it into like a wet lab so i can just go do stuff like this <clears throat> okay i'm just gonna have you start cloning things yeah and build like thrusters yeah all right i think that's it we're at 51 minutes 27 seconds <clears throat> i think we uh we've we've gone far enough off topic talking about cool science stuff that we want you to make in your garage yeah I mean, so, these are the skills that you get from a misspent youth. I can, I, I can name like twenty four different types of cannabis if that's my skills from a misspent youth. Can you recite all of the presidents? Oh God! If I think about, it, I used to be able to, and I did it recently. I did it. it I did it. I wrote them all down. Um, maybe in March, I did it. But I, I can't. Think, I have to. I have to write them down. But I could do it. <laughs> uh, pull up a list, and I'll try it, and I'll see how close I am. I haven't okay. done this in probably 15 years, but I'm gonna give it a shot. It's it a song I, my mom taught me as a kid. Oh, I can I can do it. I used to be able to do the uh the presidents with their vice presidents from memory in like eighth grade. And I could do that all the way through high school. It's just something I haven't done in a long time. All right, go. All right. Washington, Adams, Jefferson, Madison, Monroe, Adams, Jackson, Van Buren, Harrison, Tyler, Polk, Taylor, Fillmore, Pierce, Buchanan, Lincoln, Johnson, Grant. Hayes, Garfield, Arthur, Cleveland, Harrison, Cleveland, McKinley, Roosevelt, Taft, Wilson, Harding, Coolidge, Ford, Carter. Nope. Uh, see, that's where I always mix it up. Harding, Coolidge, Hoover. Hoover. Roosevelt. Roosevelt. Truman, Eisenhower, Kennedy, Johnson, Nixon, Ford, Carter, Reagan, Bush, Clinton, Bush, Obama, Trump. <laughs> Good job. I'm, that's not bad. No, that I was, always I always mix it up around like the Harding, Coolidge, Ford, that one because it's like it doesn't quite string together. But yeah, Kevin Coolidge is is one of my favorite presidents. So that's uh that's the song you got to use. Oh, okay. Kevin Coolidge has like the like most hard ass presidential photo. Yeah. He just looks mean. Like there's clearly not even a smile, not even a, it's just a, I'm going to hurt somebody kind of look. All right. Um, yeah, I think that's it. All right. So Jay, we have a meeting. Is that in six minutes or 66 minutes? 66 minutes, I believe. And I oh. hope it is because I'm definitely not going to be on in six minutes. I'm about to take I have, a nap. I have not eaten breakfast yet. Yeah, that's you want to see my breakfast? Oh my god. Two beef jerky sticks. Why? Why? Oh my god, Brad. They're two hundred they're 120 calories a piece, 23 grams of protein a piece with minimal fats and carbs. I eat like five of these a day. I buy I buy four boxes a month on Amazon. That's it. very interesting. Why? Beef jerky is the best food ever. Beef jerky is awesome. I just can't imagine eating it for breakfast. It's too salty. Oh, I eat them for breakfast, lunch, <laughs> dinner. I mean, it, like, <clears throat> you know, uh, you're so proud of yourself, Brad. You are so proud of yourself. That was really good. We should, what I want you to do. Just like is, out of nowhere. I haven't done that in forever. What I want you to do is sing it with the full tune, though, and, and look at a list so you make sure you hit them all, and then we'll auto-tune it. 
Can we do that? I don't know yeah, how to do, but that'd be I hilarious. Do. I do. Yeah. If you if you record that to an actual, just get me an audio file of you going through. I'll auto tune it for you. Deal. Do you want me and to do I'll, it live on Wednesday? Or do you want me to do it before? No, just record it. And we can play it Wednesday for everybody. Okay. Yeah. No beef jerky. Like when you when you're laying in bed when you, when right before you go to bed, you know when you get like late night late night hunger. Like this is what I eat is beef jerky. I, things I've never heard before. So beef jerky. So when you're laying in bed. <laughs> yeah, you don't eat in bed. I do all the time. No. I, I, have, I can say I have... I don't think maybe since I was like a kid and like snuck snack up, snacks up to my room, I don't think I've ever eaten in bed. So I never... Or if ate, I've been like really sick and somebody brought me toast. I never ate in, in bed. Never ate in my room ever. And then I met Lisa and it's like snacks galore in, at bedtime. <sighs> I don't get that. Yeah, I, I didn't either, but now I love it. It's like it's my favorite like, of the day. I don't have a TV in my room either. Oh, I do. I don't. I don't watch TV at, when I go to bed. Oh, see, I can't go to sleep. I I can. I have to work in silence, but I can't sleep in silence. I can't fall asleep in silence. So it, it has to be turned off. It has to be on sleep timer. But I cannot fall asleep in silence because then the house creaks and scares me, and then I have to go around the house with a gun, making sure everything's safe sweet yeah you don't do that you don't hop up out of bed and like clear all the rooms in your house in the middle of the night when you hear a creak i'm the only one okay uh no because i have dogs yeah so do i and i don't trust them oh my dogs bark at like right yeah they bust they bark at everything they give too many false positives and i just don't trust their <laughs> judgment anymore i mean like if somebody came into my room like my dogs are not mean but like they're pretty big i mean i have a mean dog and my wife, he, my wife came home one night. She like the, she got like low census or whatever. So she like came home from the hospital at like two in the morning and she walked into the bedroom and both the dogs just like, they didn't know who it was and they just lost their minds. And I thought she, she was going to die. Like if I walk, you can, if my dogs are downstairs, they're not allowed upstairs in the bedroom. So if I'm downstairs, if somebody's downstairs and some, somebody's with the dogs and somebody comes downstairs or upstairs to where the dogs are, the dogs will go berserk. They will let everybody know, hey, there's a person here. Hey, there's a person coming. But if <clears throat> if nobody's on the floor with them and somebody, it, like, I don't think they bark. If you knock on my door, they would. But like today, I got all the way to the office at 5.15 this morning, realized I left my laptop at home, drove back, went home, opened the garage, went in the house. The dogs were just like looking at me with no sounds. Yeah. The worst German shepherds ever. Word. All right. <clears throat> Brad. Wednesday. I think Mike's with us on Wednesday. Is he? I think so. Let me check the calendar. Um, Wednesday. Where's that next? Mike. Time? Yeah. Oh. Huh. We're gonna Miguel. cover. We're gonna cover knees. Oh. The knee is such an interesting joint. Do you know what's the most interesting about it? What? The patella. Because it just floats. Um, because the reason it's there is it provides. It makes the mechanical advantage of your quad extensors like 5 billion percent more efficient. Oh. And 5 billion. Your knee has what's called a screw home mechanism. So it like basically articulates like this, but then as you like go to final terminal extension, it does this. Oh. Yeah. You know it's an interesting joint. What? OG, OG Kush. All right. Oh we're going to get God. out of here. <laughs> and I, I'm actually impressed you got that reference. Um, that was a, the look of disgust on your face, though, is. <laughs> oh, is this what it's like being a parent and having a teenager? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yep. Yep. Yep, I had a full conversation with a 10-year-old that he started. I did not start this conversation about furry, fuzzies, furries the other day. Uh, I don't know. I don't know. Uh, you do. You just you Google it. It was awkward and horrible. And then it then he started asking questions about like weird adult things that I was not comfortable. Are you looking it up right now? Mm, no. You should Google it. All right. Please. Google that or my Wikipedia page is now open to Calvin Coolidge, which I'm going to read about this afternoon when I eat lunch. So <clears throat> we are out. Same macro time. Same macro channel. All right. Same macro channel. Yes. Everybody have a good one. We will see you on Wednesday with Mike, I believe. Um, otherwise, that's it.